Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. In the last episode, we took a look at a few theories concerning Josh's campus and a few of the suspicious monks working and living there. Today, we take a look at one of the most mysterious objects in this entire case, Josh's computer. Now, to paint a picture for you guys as to life in 2002, we need to remember that during this time, the internet was a few years old but still fairly new. Not everybody had a computer, and when they did have a computer, it was usually a bulky tower with a monitor. And it took up some space. Technically, laptops existed but weren't very common at this time and were very expensive. Technically, cell phones existed, but again, they were very rudimentary and only rich businessmen seemed to have these. Security cameras existed as well, but weren't as common as today, so you didn't have surveillance cameras at every street corner during this time. It's important to remember that Josh lived at a time when some of the technology was still very young. When Josh disappeared, nobody looked at his computer right away. With the belief that he fell into the nearby waters, his computer just wasn't a consideration in his search early on. So it was a few days before Stearns County took Josh's computer to copy the hard drive. And it's a shame because strange things went on on this computer following Josh's disappearance. One of the things that was determined was that activity took place on his computer the night of his disappearance. From 11.52pm to 12.32am, music was played and several songs were skipped during that time, so somebody was accessing Josh's computer. But who? Remember I said Josh left the card party at approximately 11.55pm, but it is possible that this time is a little off. Maybe Josh left at say 11.47pm and maybe he did make it back to his dorm. Although there is no badging data, but it's possible the door wasn't properly closed or that he caught the door behind another student as it was closing. To this day, nobody has ever come forward saying they let Josh in or saw him in the dorm past midnight. From what I gathered, the music listened to was pretty consistent with music that Josh usually listened to. So could it have been Josh? It is also possible that the computer was accessed by one of his roommates. Let's remember that Josh had five roommates. This was at a time when not everybody had a computer. So I don't know how many of Josh's roommates had their own computers. Was Josh the only one? Were there a couple of other computers? Josh seemed to be pretty open, letting roommates use his computer when they needed. I don't know to what extent Josh let his roommates use his computer. Did he let them use it uh, when he wasn't at the dorm? I, I don't know. Now, we know that Nick was gone at this time to the girls' dorms. Greg got back around 3 a.m., though he doesn't live on the same floor. Another roommate was out of town, and two roommates' location for that night are unaccounted for, so we don't know if they were at the dorm or somewhere else. So, it's still a mystery as to who was on Josh's computer from 11.52 p.m. to 12.32 a.m. Was it Josh? Was it one of his roommates? Apparently, stuff was deleted from Josh's computer that very night. Even more suspicious, an internet washer was used about 3 or 4 days after Josh's disappearance. A washer was a program back then that you downloaded and it erased information like your internet history, cookies, etc. Today we can do these things easily from our internet browser. But who put in the effort of downloading and using this internet washer on Josh's computer? And for what purpose? Over the years, a number of people have taken a look at Josh's hard drive. They had to use different forensic recovery software or tools to try to find the information that was deleted. Some of the more up-to-date information comes from a gentleman by the name of Justin Thole, who has done a lot of meticulous work regarding Josh's hard drive. Once you start backtracking Josh's activities on his computer, there are definitely activities that provide further insight into Josh, and behaviors that now open new theories over his disappearance. Now, the information I'm about to share here comes from either Justin Thole, Stearns County Sheriff Department, or both. As I mentioned last episode, searches were made, most likely by Josh, over the monks abuse scandal. Several different types of searches were done over the month of October, such as monks abuse scandal, strange men following men on campus, and oddities in the woods. Definitely strange that these types of searches were made prior to his disappearance. During the month of October, Josh also visited pornographic sites. Now, a 20-year-old college student visiting pornographic sites, that's the least surprising thing in the world to me. But what can be an area of interest was the type of pornography and the increase in frequency that these sites were visited. On the Simply Vanish podcast, Justin Thole explained that prior to October 2002, Josh's internet activities were pretty mundane and ordinary. 
visiting sports sites, movie sites, etc. Not many pornographic sites visited to speak of. Although he was still with his girlfriend Katie until the summer, but after the summer he was single so the increase in pornography consumption doesn't surprise me too much. However, what was surprising was the type of pornography. It ranged from heterosexual to homosexual pornography. Josh had been seeing both men and women. Again, none of this really surprises me. Justin Thole also stated that throughout the month of October, the frequency of the visits of these sites increased and the pornography got more explicit. So I think it's fair to say that Josh was maybe developing a bit of an online addiction at this point. I often wondered if maybe it was one of Josh's roommates that had actually been watching this pornography. Remember, some of Josh's roommates did use his computer. However, Justin Thole stated that a lot of these activities were done late at night or early in the mornings. Justin also obtained Josh's badging data into his dorm all the times that Josh used his keycard to enter the dorms. And the times that he entered the dorm were mostly consistent with his computer activities. For example, badging into his dorm at a certain time and he accessed his computer minutes later. So for all intended purposes, we are left to assume that Josh did in fact visit these pornographic sites. Another area of interest was Josh had downloaded a Yahoo chat program. I believe in mid-2002. I remember these types of chat rooms. You usually had several types of rooms to choose from, whether it was sports, law, or more romantic or sexual oriented chats. At first Josh was using his own name and zip code to chat with people, but he eventually created two other profiles, presenting himself as a female. You could argue that maybe Josh was trolling, but it would seem that Josh used these profiles to chat sexually with men or couples. So, was Josh gay or bisexual? Obviously we don't know for sure, although on the Simply Vanish podcast, Josh Newville did interview a man who claims Josh attempted to kiss him in their youths. So we have to assume that there was, at a minimum, a little bit of curiosity there. Friends and family seem quick to shut down any implication that Josh was gay or questioning his sexuality. But speaking from experience, you can really fly under everybody's radar if you really want to. If you're wondering why any of this matters, it matters because it opens up new venues of investigation. Now, you may be wondering what my credibility is in all this. Well, nothing really. No, I'm not an investigator nor law enforcement. I'm just a thinking citizen who does a bit of research and a bit of a philosopher in my own way. I am also a gay man. I'm approximately the age that Josh would be now, so I was around his age in early 2000. So I remember those days, early 2000s university, computer activity, being in the closet, scared, and using chat lines as an outlet, and going for the occasional night encounter. Josh's family and friends might say this is out of character for him, but if you're in the closet and scared, you might do things that are out of character and not safe, speaking from experience. And I will say, the state in which Josh's dorm room was left in is consistent with a hookup. A lot of people thought it was strange that Josh had left everything in his room. Wallet, car keys, glasses, contacts case with his contacts still in them. Seems weird that he would disappear with none of these things on him, right? He literally disappeared with nothing but a St. John's grey hoodie, which wasn't warm enough for that cold November night, and his key to his dorm, and that's it, he had nothing else of note on him. So let's assume that Josh did plan a sexual hookup that night. Why did he wear just a hoodie and not a warmer coat? Well, it could be a college student just being a little careless, but it could also be that he didn't want to sweat under a warm coat if he was going for a hookup. Why didn't he bring his wallet? Well, he could have been a little nervous or scared that he would get mugged or something, so he thought it would be best for him to leave his wallet behind. Why not wear his glasses or his contact lenses? Well, obviously he would want to look his best, so he probably wouldn't wear his glasses. He could have worn his contact lenses, but he could have been worried that one would fall out or something, So, or maybe he just didn't need them. As I mentioned before concerning Josh's wallet, I don't know if he had it on him at the card party. If he did, it would mean that he did make it back to his dorm that night. If Josh was planning a hookup, it could explain why he left the card party somewhat discreetly. Did he make it back to his dorm and listen to music and had some encounter lined up? Obviously we don't know for sure. The only thing that bucks this theory is that there is no evidence that Josh chatted online with somebody to arrange a meeting or hook up that night. So Josh was using Yahoo chat to chat in different rooms and the sexual nature of these chats progressed during the month of October. Josh chatted with men, women and seemingly straight couples later in the month. 
Josh had a webcam as well, and there is evidence that he had viewed other people on their webcams. Here's where things get even more bizarre. On October 28th, a little more than a week before Josh's disappearance, something significant seemed to have happened. There is evidence that Josh visited Yahoo administration. Apparently he wanted to report a user for misconduct. We don't know who or what the misconduct was. Josh actually used a calling card to call an unknown number. As far as we know, he didn't call his family or friends. You usually buy a number of minutes on calling cards, so normally people use them for more important calls, like family or friends. But Josh used his calling card to talk for 28 minutes to an unknown number. So who was he talking to? Was there a connection with Yahoo to report a user for misconduct? That same day, Josh uninstalled and deleted the entire Yahoo chat program. And as far as we know, he didn't download it again or use it after October 28th. So, what went on here? Is this strange event connected to his disappearance? When I let my little brain wander, here are my 5 theories as to what could have happened that day. Now keep in mind that there is no evidence of anything here, so this is just my own personal brainstorming. 1. Josh gets into an altercation with a fellow student. Since Josh was sometimes chatting under his own name, or under two names of female profiles, did Josh somehow get discovered by one of his fellow students on campus? Could this student have somehow blackmailed Josh, threatening to expose him or something? Expose him for being gay or as pretending to be a female to catfish photos from men. Josh could have tried to get him banned from Yahoo chat on the basis of being threatened. Josh panics, gets him banned from Yahoo then uninstalls the program himself. This scenario doesn't quite explain how Josh would disappear though. This blackmailing student would have most likely needed some resources from outside the campus to make Josh disappear. Unless this was a very homophobic straight man, this would be taking things pretty far. But crazier things have happened. 2. Josh crosses paths online with a monk. It is possible that Josh somehow came across a profile or even a webcam used by one of the monks on campus. We know that some of these monks had histories with college students. So did Josh have him banned from Yahoo chat? This monk panics over possibly being exposed and orchestrates a plan to make Josh vanish as soon as possible? 3. Josh crosses paths with unsavory characters. As I mentioned, Josh seemed to have been consuming increasingly explicit material over the month of October. We don't know exactly what these were, but did Josh chat online with some unsavory characters with bizarre or illegal sexual appetites? Was Josh spooked to the point that he felt he had to get this person off Yahoo chat? But then why would Josh himself delete the program? 4. Josh is hacked. Did Josh somehow come across a hacker, somebody who had a little too much information on him? Josh panics, attempts to get them kicked off, then deletes the program? 5. Completely unrelated. It is possible that this event is completely unrelated to Josh's disappearance, and Josh had an individual banned from Yahoo for other reasons. But then it must have been significant for Josh to also delete the program. The 28 minute use of a calling card is also concerning. But again, we don't know if it's connected. One of the big mysteries is who could have deleted stuff on Josh's computer. Stuff was supposedly deleted the same night of his disappearance and a washer was used a few days later to delete even more stuff. It's a mystery that has been mentioned on the Unsolved Mysteries episode and on various podcasts. It is also worth mentioning that for a few days following Josh's disappearance, his dad Brian Guimont and Uncle Paul did stay at Josh's dorm room as the searches for Josh were going on. One theory was that maybe they downloaded the internet washer to get rid of embarrassing or incriminating evidence. However, on the Simply Vanish podcast, Paul Gimo admitted that they wouldn't have known how to do that back then. They weren't aware that something like that happened, and I don't buy that they would have deleted information on Josh's computer and risked deleting evidence. The washer was downloaded sometime in between Brian and Paul using Josh's computer for doing various searches. So it would seem that somebody carefully planned to do this when Brian and Paul stepped out of the dorm. There must have been evidence of something they wanted to get rid of. If we go back to the theory of the monks, some monks did live in the dorm houses. So some monks would, to a certain extent, have access to the students' dorms. So could it have been a monk that deleted stuff on Josh's computer? If there was a possible altercation between Josh and the monk, whether in person or online, could this be a, why a monk would try to get rid of any evidence? There is another tidbit of information that I came across. 
Back in episode 3, I mentioned that a document was sent to State Attorney General Mike Hatch from Brian Gimo and Attorney Jim Rothstein. I had mentioned that Katie Benson, Alex Jude and a couple of other friends came to confront Brian in a restaurant. I had mentioned that paragraph 2 had a passage stating, During this confrontation, they became very subdued when they were informed that we had cracked Josh's computer and found the phony driver's license operation. Jude stated, We erased all that information. When questioned about the narcotics business they had going on, they had nothing to say. It is apparent that they knew what I was talking about. The line Jude stated we erased all that information perplexes me. What does this mean exactly? Now, Alex Jude didn't have access to the dorms, but he was friends with Josh's ex-roommates. So could one of their roommates have gone to delete information on the computer? Was there information or chats over fake IDs or a narcotics operation that they wanted to delete and might have inadvertently deleted other crucial evidence in the process? To this day, all of Josh's roommates were up and down that they never touched the computer after his disappearance. Now, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody here, but if one of their friends did erase stuff from Josh's computer, they could possibly be scared of coming forward today for tampering with evidence or something. Now, when it comes to Josh's computer, I've heard different things about how much deleted information was recovered. On some accounts, I've heard that everything was recovered, except maybe some encrypted data. The Mike Hatch document actually says this pretty much in paragraph 2 section C. I've heard other accounts that only about one third of all the computer's data had been recovered. This would make more sense since Justin Thole seems to still be discovering information. Most people believe that the purpose of deleting information after Josh's disappearance was to remove the fake IDs and preventing Josh and other people involved from getting into trouble. But on the Simply Vanish podcast, Justin Thole affirmed that these fake IDs were Adobe files that were never deleted. There are only four or five of them. But if they were never deleted, then that is very mysterious as well. If they didn't want to delete the fake IDs, what else did they want to delete? the links to visited pornographic sites, but nobody knew about this behavior from Josh at this time. The Unsolved Mysteries episode also provided pics of men who were recovered on Josh's computer, probably from his various chats and profiles on Yahoo. The Guimond family was surprised by this. Brian Guimo believes Stearns County Sheriff had these pictures since 2003, but didn't want to release them to the public until 2022, 20 years after Josh's disappearance. Now, I think I might know why these pictures were not released any earlier. This was probably a calculated decision by the Stearns County Sheriff Department. Most of these men, if not all, have nothing to do with Josh's disappearance. So we don't know what their life and family situations were. Releasing these photos could have exposed them as not only being gay, but possibly being kidnappers or even killers. I think it could have hurt a lot of innocent people. It's possible that the people who have caused harm to Josh aren't even here or might not even be using their real photo. So should they have released these pictures any sooner? I'm kinda torn on the question. On one hand, an innocent human being has disappeared here and everyone wants to find out what happened to him. On the other hand, you could have been putting a lot of innocent people in harm's way. I don't know if these men were local either. I mean, did they all live in Minnesota at the time? Were they all over the United States or all over the world? If they're not local, then it's probably a very long shot. So what happened on Josh's computer the week following his disappearance? Did friends and roommates simply want to delete some basic chats referring to drug use or fake ID use? Or was it more sinister and a monk went to delete information because his interactions with Josh would be on this computer? Or were they looking to delete a possible paper that Josh wanted to write about the monk's abuse scandal? Did Josh's online sexual exploration during the month of October land him in very hot water? Or was November 9th simply a sexual encounter gone wrong and the end result was Josh forever vanishing? Or was Josh catfished by a group of homophobes? The possibilities seem endless and until more evidence is uncovered from Josh's hard drive, we are just left to wonder. 